I'd like to invite um, Sandra, please come up, welcome. She's from the Arts Faculty, Department of Foreign Languages, and um, she uses podcasts. And her students are able to repeatedly access these audio um, recorded presentations online. And Sandra, welcome, and thank you also for the effort and thinking about the students when they are not on campus. Uh, it's about um, reinforcement, and she's thought, uh, she's done a lot of thinking about reinforcing the, the, the subject. Thank you. Good morning. Okay, how does this work? <coughs> okay, um, my colleague Sandra van der Jenen, who unfortunately can't be here today, and I, um, we decided earlier this year, or basically at the beginning of the year, to um, yeah, to try out this blended approach because up until then we had um, taught more traditionally, you know, from a textbook with handouts, copies, and all of that. Um, but I started um, experimenting with podcasts and vodcasts on a very basic level last year in my class, and I needed some sort of a platform to share it uh, with the class and to make it more dynamic. So we decided to, to go on this journey together. And um, so this is more an account of a trial and error journey through the year, um, more touching on the, on the surface of things rather than going um, more into detail. Um, OK, so <coughs> what were our expectations when we started um, basically to have a, a platform for communication um, between the lecturer and the student um, and also to have electronic submissions. Um, we kind of, or especially I very much like the idea that they can, um, that the students can submit their assignments electronically and that that mark then would be um, uh, transferred into the grade book. It's just very nice for documenting and keeping track of everything. Um, but then especially for uh, student engagement outside the classroom, um, student engagement in learning a language is very, very important. Um, it's, it's very difficult to learn a language with one lecture a week, for example. You've forgotten most of what you've learned by the next week. And learning a foreign language um, also means that you, you don't encounter that language at all in your everyday life. Um, and with students at UWC, most of them have not had the chance to travel abroad yet, to experience foreign languages, even though they are in a multicultural context, multilingual context in South Africa, um, uh, learning a, a language that's completely foreign um, is a very different thing. So. Um, to, to foster the student engagement, um, to not just have it inside the classroom, but also outside the classroom. That was our goal. And then, um, and then also to accommodate audiovisual projects, which is basically podcasts, podcasts that students can. For example, I, I have always been a timid person in the classroom, and I learned my languages. And I hated being called up to the front to do, to act out a dialogue. <laughs> Um, to, to speak in front of people um, and also to say something in general and to then be criticized because my pronunciation was wrong. Um, which unfortunately, if you don't, if no one tells you, you won't know, so you can't improve. But still, it's, it's a thing you have to come to terms with. And especially in a first year course, um, my students are still very timid to speak up in front of the class. So what I did last year then was I asked people, uh, students, to, to tape themselves on their cell phone. Um, I gave them a very short text that I asked them to read, and then they taped themselves on the cell phone, and they sent it to me. And that worked out very well. I could give them feedback that's personal, and no one else heard it. So they didn't really f feel uh, intimidated by that task. Um, and that was something that I really thought, on I can, I can broaden that or, or work more on it, or maybe even expand it to something visual to ask a group of students to act out a dialogue and tape themselves. Um, they have better cell phones than mine. Mine can't really do that well, but um, in a group, at least one person would have some sort of device that can tape. Um, 
And then, yeah, and then I can give them feedback only for the group, not necessarily in front of the entire class. And then also be more critical and give them constructive criticism that they can actually really work with to improve themselves. So that was basically the idea behind this. Um, okay, so first to communication. As I say, it was our first attempt at using Ecamfa and we overlooked a lot of details that we just simply weren't aware of. Um, I told my students they really have to use the Ecamfa platform for communication, to send me emails. They have to do it on Ecamfa, not into my group wise. I simply would not respond if they send it to my group wise. And um, <coughs> that the nice thing about it is I can filter it much more easily. Um, it doesn't get lost, a, a student email doesn't get lost in all my other emails um, that concern different things. However, when I responded, a lot of times I forgot to tick off the little box, which means if I don't tick off this box that says send copy of this message to recipient's email address, then the, the students only receive that email on eCamfa. That means they actually really have to go onto that platform in order to see that they received an email. Whereas when you take off that little box, they get it in their My UWC email account. So that took me a while to figure that out. I didn't quite realize it was so important. Um, and then students told me, but we didn't get the email. But I had sent it, so what could be the problem? Um, and then another thing um, with regards to submissions that's probably quite unique to foreign languages in a way, but it technically could also be, Afrikaans also has these things. Okay, mm -hmm. um, the thing is we ask our students to upload their assignments under submissions so that we could mark it and then uh, their grade would appear on uh, Ani come find everything would work well and it sounded so great and it worked really well. And then sometimes it didn't because then we received this error status when we tried to open the attachment and we couldn't quite figure out now why. Sometimes it would open and sometimes it wouldn't and it seemed to be very random. Then it would open mine but my colleagues, French ones, wouldn't open. So we sat there, we wondered, and we tried, and we couldn't figure it out. And we ran to the ECAMFA staff quite frequently um, to help us solve these mysterious problems. In the end, what happened was um, ECAMFA simply doesn't speak for it, <laughs> which means that you cannot use any funny letters. German has umlaute. You know, those A, O, and U with the dots on top? Don't put it into your file name because then Ikamfa cannot read it because Ikamfa does not speak German. <laughs> and <laughs> this one is the example of the French um, attachment and it's got this haki, another C, uh, CD. That is the only reason why the whole document doesn't open. So we got this a lot and it was very, very frustrating. But the solution to it was actually quite easy. Um, it's not the best. We want our students to sort of Im immerse as much as they can into the language. So when they learn something about identity, they should give their document the title in German or French. But we obviously now for practical reasons couldn't do that. So I asked my students to simply give it an English name uh, because then the documents always open up. Um, but yeah, so. Then marking assignments, and there some of these things, especially my colleague struggled with because she does a lot of marking from home. Um, okay, first the good thing, e-marking enables better documentation of progress <laughs> um, because it's, it's in a safe place. It's always this I idea of a, a cloud. You can access it from anywhere where you've got internet access, so things do not really get lost. Um, and the marks and the comments that I gave, I can quickly check again what did I tell the student. Uh, so it's, it's very nice and concise. Um, and it always feels to me it's a, it's a very nice yeah, documentation space. Um, but let's say, you're busy writing your comment and a lot of times, especially in languages, 
you have quite a, a long comment to it um, because you don't just say what's wrong but also maybe how to improve. However, let's say the internet connection fails you or there's a power cut <laughs> or things like that. Um, your comment is gone. You have to write over again. Um, and that's fine if that happens once, but if it happens more frequently, <coughs> it's a tiring exercise. Um, what I ultimately started doing was to write it offline and copy paste it in, but it's, it's time consuming. So, um, yeah, marking from home, there I speak on behalf of my colleague especially. Um, and she told me, if a comfort kicks you out more than once, access is denied for the rest of the weekend. Apparently there are security measures in place to make sure no one hacks into your system. However, she was usually identified as the hacker. <laughs> and <laughs> up until now could not really resolve this issue. And that's, that was for her frustrating to such an extent that she has really uh, used the camera to a minimum in the last uh, term. Um, yeah, because the access really was denied and she couldn't get into it at all anymore until the Monday where she then had to first find help again to, to tell the system that she's actually the person that's authorized to use it. But yeah. Um, so yeah, what we've done, both of us, um, to, to not be so dependent on internet, because internet can fail you, um, we download all the assignments um, and then we mark them offline with track changes and you know the usual things and then save it and then upload it again. But that is very, very time consuming. Um, it, it take, it's much more time consuming than quickly doing it by hand. Um, but yeah, the benefit of it again is that you've got it documented and um, it's nice for the students as well um, to, to receive it online in a safe place where they can access it and not you know, just have one hard copy of it that might get lost along the way somewhere. So yeah. Then grade book tracking, as I said, when you um, put the, when you grade or mark your assignment, the grade goes into the grade book. It's all very nice. You've got the, the names, the student name, and the student can see their marks for each assignment. And then there is a course grade section. That course grade section, however, is quite confusing for my students because it's the average of all the, the marks that they received for their assignments that are in um, that are uploaded in the system. However, this doesn't match with the um, huh? one one minute. <laughs> huh? That's one minute left. Okay, I speak very fast. It doesn't <laughs> it doesn't match up with a mess schedule, the weighing, and you know a vocab test doesn't necessarily weigh the same as a class <coughs> test or those kind of things. Um, so it's very confusing. My first year students have no idea where they are and what their progress mark is because they look at this and it's different from the mark that I give them that's you know according to the weighing of the mess schedule. So maybe if one could customize that eventually, that would be quite nice. If I could have access to, um, to you know, g giving weighings to the different marks, that would be very nice. Um, yeah, here's another example of the class average, which really isn't the average at all. Okay, so student engagement outside the classroom. There are many possibilities like blogs, discussion forums, wikis, etc. Um, but they need <laughs> guidance, they need an incentive. It must be linked to marks. Uh, they, they must get something out of it, otherwise the engagement simply isn't there. Um, and then my students, for example, were not so fond of the blog because they found it doesn't really fit onto the screen, so they had, it's, it's, it's teeny tiny efforts, but it puts them off using it. So if the blog doesn't fit into the screen, they actually need to go on it, scroll it to the side for each sentence that they're reading, and that's very impractical. So they didn't really like that as yeah, the appearance. Um, and then it's a very time consuming thing to actually <coughs> really monitor student engagement. Um, I've given that task to my tutor because tutors for us can't really help with marking, 
um, unless they're mother tongue speakers. So um, that's the forum for my tutor now, um, and that really fills his time very well to monitor the and give guidance as well. Um, audio audiovisual projects, that's actually the major issue I've got. We've, you know, I've, I've met a lot of walls, brick walls, and I managed to climb over it. This one I haven't quite managed yet. Um, my problem really is the 20 megabyte upload uh, limits because you can't really upload anything um, of quality um, that's longer than, I don't know, two and a half minutes. So um, the audio recordings and all of these exercises that I mentioned before, that those student activities have great potential, but my students cannot upload them. They would then have to uh, compress them. But it's first year students. They feel very overwhelmed with new things. So you know, to get them, to make them comfortable on the platform was a huge success in the first place. But then, um, to also expect them to be that technology savvy, to compress things and still keep the quality. I mean, I haven't managed to do it, and I can't really expect my students to be able to do it. Some students can do all sorts of things. Other students are still unfamiliar with using email. So one can't really expect that from them. And um, I have introduced a flipped classroom concept into my classroom this year, which basically means that I provide my students with a podcast before, uh, before the, the next week to introduce the theory and the topic. And then our class time is spent on, on um, engagement, on exercises, on um, really learning the concepts. And I cannot <coughs> really upload proper lecture casts with a low limit such as 20 megabytes, I have to put it into part one, part two, part three, part four sometimes to get 12 minutes of a voice over PowerPoint into it um, or onto the system. So those are things that I, I'd like to explore more next year. Hopefully next year I can give a, uh, a more positive account on that. Um, but yeah, so those are things that we kind of experienced um, all in all it's valuable especially for us as an admin tool currently not so much as a uh, learning tool yet because our uh, projects would be more audio visual therefore they need more space um, to upload onto to be uploadable really onto the system and uh, yeah that's basically <coughs> all I had to say <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm glad uh, Enver is also here from ICS because, um, as you can hear, Enver, that people need more space within these uh, spaces, and we are having more people coming on board. But it's not just the number of clicks; it's what people, the resources they want to place online. Okay. And a very good point you made that we think the students are that savvy with technology. So we're asking the lecturers, the students must come for training. They do not know how to complete these videos, etc. And they didn't have the time to send their students for training. We could only do a demo. But some students that get the broadcast and podcast training, it, it assists them as well. Because the lecturers find out now that these students it doesn't mean they can WhatsApp and Facebook because they still need to know sometimes how to use the tools. And in space, I mean, you know, things are, we are busy with ICS and they are trying to increase the number of resources you can place within the system. I thank you very much. Any questions for the person? <coughs> um, yes. yes sir. Sir. I just to ask, and it sounds like, is there a blog tool on your camera? Because we use Google Blogs. Yes. There is, but it wasn't satisfactory. Mm. No. So people are using Canva, and we're also helping them outside the elements with the other applications as we 